Hello from the Hispanic Society Museum and Library. Today marks one year since we began our series of videos on the women of the Hispanic Society. In honor of International Women's Day, we continue to celebrate the women artists, writers, librarians, curators, and scholars who have influenced the collection or played a role in the institution. Today's episode is the first in a series dedicated exclusively to the women who were employed as permanent staff at the museum and library. Many of them worked here for decades, five in most cases. They remain devoted to the institution and to its founder, Archer Huntington, working side by side, following Huntington's direction and moreover, his aspirations. We begin with an overview to explain the first steps in the museum and library's development. Forthcoming videos will focus on individual staff members and their contributions. We hope you enjoy this video and we thank you for watching. The first years at the Hispanic Society were challenging for many of the staff members because the approach to the museology field was so innovative that it seemed like an experiment to some. Yet it was all a part of Huntington's methodology, which aimed to develop a knowledge base in the wide array of holdings in the Hispanic Society's collection. To fulfill his vision, Huntington ensured that all of the necessary resources and tools were made available to his employees. Educational trips with unrestricted budgets were organized across different continents. In this way, the women were able to study the direct sources of the materials about which they were to become experts. During these trips, they had access to the libraries, archives, and private collections that were necessary for their education and development. They also had the opportunity to speak with, exchange ideas with, and hear the opinions of the most notable academics, and to personally meet the artists whose works Huntington had purchased, in some cases even visiting their studios. This was also a matter of self-development, which expanded the professional horizons of many of the women. They entered the institution as librarians and focused on cataloging and studying the library's vast holdings, but Huntington also offered them dominion over other parts of his collection. For the next five decades, these women worked passionately, encouraged both by the founder's charismatic personality and by all of the resources at their disposal. As a result, they were able to master new subjects and be recognized in the academic world for their knowledge of a culture and language that had earlier been so foreign to most of them. During the first years, their roles focused on the library. It was not only to catalog, but to study in depth the books, manuscripts, and cartographic collection. They also studied Spanish and Portuguese in order to do translations. Their tasks were diverse and wide-ranging because the various parts of the collection reflected each other. All of the pieces, books, artwork, photographs, decorative objects, textiles, and artifacts with a distinct ethnographic value were related to each other, and it was essential to understand how they were interconnected. Working on the collection from this perspective allowed them to construct a global and encyclopedic vision of the material, a necessary model because the vastness of Hispanic culture impacted many of the Earth's continents. This interconnectedness required daily communication among all of the museum's departments, and above all, it involved teamwork and shared responsibilities. It was not the museum's first curators that began this work, but this group of women who first helped Huntington to organize the collection at its most basic level, making it accessible not only to scholars, but also to the general public. Their work was crucial for the development of the collection and to better understand it. Selecting the staff for the institution was one of the more complicated tasks. The first curators of the Hispanic Society, from its founding in 1904 until the end of the first decade, were all men, including Mansfield Hill House, Francis Lathrop, who served as art director, Edward Stevenson, who was a cartographer, and William Starkweather, who was curator of paintings. The first female curator, Mildred Stapley Bine, served with her husband, Arthur, from 1916 to 1918 as curators of architecture and allied arts. One year later, Isabel K. McDermott became curator of publications. Huntington's precise reasons for placing women at the head of the organization are unknown, but there were various setbacks and a lack of understanding among the first male curators that led him to re-strategize the organization's structure in order to find the right individuals who would understand his goals. 
From 1917 onwards, Huntington hired female librarians and a few professional photographers to start working on the gems of his collection, the items most precious to him, which included his vast compilation of books and manuscripts. A few years later, satisfied with their work and loyalty, Huntington decided that they would be the ideal staff to manage and administrate the other parts of his collection. Huntington recruited his employees from colleges and universities for women. Some of these include Simmons College, founded by the Bostonian John Simmons in 1899. Because photography was to be another important tool used to study, record, and share the collection, Huntington looked to institutions like the Clarence White School of Photography, known for promoting photography as a proper academic subject and for providing women with tools to both join the workforce and to express themselves artistically. Prior to their roles at the Hispanic Society, these individuals had never been trained as art historians, nor did they have any previous knowledge of the Hispanic world, yet they succeeded in achieving a respectable level of expertise. It is important to point out yet another extraordinary situation that moves the Hispanic Society and its founder to the avant-garde of the era regarding opportunities for persons with disabilities. Huntington sought out potential employees at universities designed for the deaf community, such as the New York School for the Deaf and Gallaudet College in Washington. But as Priscilla Muller confirms, this never created an obstacle that affected the work or the relationship amongst colleagues. In fact, as Dr. Muller describes, one of them learned sign language. The priceless testimony of the librarian who became curator of sculpture, Beatrice Gilman Prosky, provides some clues about how Huntington worked with his staff. Years after a fulfilling career, she explained during a talk given in 1984 at the National Sculpture Society, Quote, By the time I arrived, the collections had been greatly enlarged and a series of publications inaugurated, but there was not yet a permanent staff to care for the objects in the museum. To remedy this omission, Mr. Huntington decided to draw upon the existing library staff. He had long thought that women would make good museum curators, and he was now ready to see what they could do. One day, he gathered us all together and announced his plan. The response was enthusiastic. He then distributed the subjects for which each person was to be responsible. Paintings were quickly appropriated by a girl who had lived in Europe. Ceramics, textiles, and metalwork followed. When it came my turn, I was at a loss what to say. My only exposure to any form of art had been one term course in art appreciation taught by an interior decorator. Mr. Huntington came to my rescue by asking if I would like to study the polychrome wood carvings that are so characteristic of Spanish sculpture. I agreed at once, and then my real education began. End quote. That sense of real education is a strong statement generally shared by the rest of the women. They were not art historians, and despite their inexperience, Huntington encouraged them to study and write immediately, beginning with short monographs published in Photostat, in which evaluations and criticisms were quoted from established authorities and also among themselves. They also published books that were professionally printed. This chapter in the history of the Hispanic Society is a unique example of how anything can be achieved, regardless of gender or abilities. This was also a unique period in the history and development of museums and museology. In some cases, we are confronted by a lack of bibliographical data about some of these women, which greatly limits our understanding of the important work they did and our ability to name these protagonists and give them the credit they deserve.